Hey guys, so today I thought I would do 15, I think it's 15, but 15 of my favorite houseplant hacks. This video is brought to you by Aspiration. Now I've mentioned the financial firm Aspiration in some of my previous videos because two years ago I opened up an account with them. Now they just released their new credit card, Aspiration Zero. No matter if you use your card for groceries, utilities, or more plants, Aspiration will plant a tree every time you swipe your card. Now, if you swipe it 60 times per month, then you could reach carbon zero, and every month you get to carbon zero, Aspiration will reward you with 1% cash back on every purchase made that month. And if you use it less often, Aspiration will still reward you 0.5% cash back. Plus, you can earn a $300 bonus when you spend $3,000 in the first 90 days. There are terms and conditions that apply, so be sure to check those out in the description below. Aspiration has a goal of planting 125 million trees, and they work diligently with local governments and partner organizations to ensure trees planted are native to the area and protected after they are planted. Aspiration also works to ensure local residents are hired to plant these new trees so that it stimulates local economies while curbing climate change. Every 1 million trees that are planted creates 10,000 workdays for the local communities. Now beyond carbon sequestration, we know that reforestation of native trees can also restore ecosystem biodiversity, support wildlife protection, and even provide agroforestry opportunities. So to apply for the Aspiration Zero credit card and get the special sign-on bonus, visit joinaspiration.com slash summer rain to start making a positive impact. All right, so let's cover 15 of my favorite houseplant hacks because these are just simple solutions. Some of them you probably already employ, but if you're new to the houseplant world, then maybe you don't even know about them yet. So I thought even though some are really simple, let's actually feature them. And if you watch the channel frequently, then you probably have seen me using these more than once. Now, I'm not going to have everything to display because I have my stuff between Brooklyn and here in upstate New York. So I have some things to show you, but other things that I'll just loop in with some extra footage so you can actually see what I'm talking about. The first one is actually watering trays. I don't have any of them here but they're like humidity mats slash watering trays, but basically what they are are long plastic trays. They have a felted top. You put water in the base of those, and then you put a plant with a terracotta planter pot because again, these are porous and they actually suck up water. So if you put that, it'll use it by capillary action, suck up water, and then you're not really watering the plant, you're just watering the humidity tray. Now, folks use these when they're going on vacation or going away, but I've used them basically every day <laughs> for years. And they're starting to get a little grungy now, but you could easily swap out the top of the tray and the plastic tray is totally fine. You could just like wash it out if you need, but I love them. I use them in my, uh, in my closet garden and on the top shelf, and they have just been lifesavers. Now, I don't keep them watered all the time because it's not great to have your plant sitting in water unless maybe you have an aquatic plant, right? But I let them dry out, so I don't water the humidity tray all the time. I let the, the plants dry out. The downside to it, and you'll see it with um, some of your terracotta planter pots, you'll see that this was being watered from the top down, and then you'll get some of these calcium deposits. So if you have hard water and the calcium deposits like settle down, then you'll have them you know, down here near the root tips. Now, if they're pulling water up, oftentimes you'll see the calcium deposits higher up on the planter pot. Now, you'll need to actually flush that out, but you won't need to flush it out every day. You know, it's, it becomes an infrequent thing that you need to do. And when you get a lot of house plants, you're looking at sometimes efficiencies and efficiencies help in being able to come up with routines that are manageable for folks. So that would be my houseplant hack number one. I, and they're no particular order, by the way. So it's not like that's my favorite one or my least favorite one. It's just a great houseplant hack. So the next one on my list is kind of an interesting one. It's using a styptic for cuttings. 
And what is a styptic? Well, a styptic is what you typically use to arrest bleeding on a person. So if you get a cut, oftentimes there's a styptic and it's a, a little powder. I think if you made it like homemade, you could probably use like cornmeal and like a baking powder, for instance. That's exactly what I did for this. So you'll notice that this is a little Hoya cutting. So you can see this is a little Hoya cutting that I have here. And you can't tell, but this is a plant that is uh, very lactiferous, so it has a latex to it. And it will often shoot off latex. And, um, and then you, you, you wanna arrest that oftentimes if you're you know, taking cuttings. So here's a, here's a Hoya bella. I'm going to cut, this is a really nice growing tip. I always hate like having to, to cut these, but I think this is um, a good place to actually cut this. There's a lack of leaves right here. And uh, I'm just gonna cut it right behind this node and just like that. And you'll notice that it has some latex coming down underneath on the stem, right? So I'm just gonna take the styptic and I'm gonna dunk it in. I'm gonna dunk it in just like that, right? It's hard, I wish, I did, I wish the styptic was a different color, but then I'm just gonna dunk that right in the water. I'm actually gonna take off a couple of these leaves also at the bottom right here. I'm just gonna dunk that in like that. So you can see I just dunked, I dunked the whole thing in just to prevent that latex from going all over the place. And then I'm going to dunk the tip of this in here just like that as well. I mean, basically it does the same thing for the plant as it does for you. It arrests the the bleeding, so to speak, but in this case, it's the latex that comes out of um, something like the family of Apocynaceae, which is, uh, includes like milkweeds and includes Hoyas, for instance, and they are customary have that kind of latex in them. So I think that's uh, a good way to go. Although, you know, some folks, if they're using like woody plant material, they would use um, a rooting hormone. This is not a rooting hormone. Um, in many cases, like some people will use that rooting hormone in order to promote kind of root growth on it. I don't typically use rooting hormones all that much, but again, this is, uh, this is a way for you know, the plant to um, just prevent the latex from uh, exuding out of the stem or the branch tip. And so that's one of my other houseplant hacks that's really easy to do. And again, you don't have to buy a styptic. They're pretty cheap and affordable on the market. You probably have one in your little first aid kit if you have a first aid kit, but otherwise you could probably make something of your own like a you know cornmeal and baking powder or something of that nature. Now the other thing that I like to do sometimes if I have the time is soaking your terracotta pots. And I may have actually mentioned this in an earlier episode and what that does is if you have a plant that enjoys a lot of water, um, I have been soaking this planter pot. Let me pull this over so I don't drip everywhere. I have been soaking this planter pot actually overnight because I remembered that I was gonna be doing this episode. And, um, and this one is well watered. So all the pores of that planter pot are filled up versus this one. You can see they're totally different colors. You see that? So. This one is well watered. This one has not been sitting. So all the pores of this wet one are filled up. And then if you actually put a plant in this pot, when you water it, oftentimes that water pulls away into the pores of the terracotta. So if you want a plant that wants to be more well watered, well, you might wanna actually soak your terracotta planter pot first. And then that way, when you water the plant, the pores of the terracotta are all actually filled up and uh, more of the plant will actually get the water. Conversely, you may not want to soak your terracotta planter pot if you have a plant that doesn't like to be sitting in wetness and it just will like, pull away really quickly. So say you have um, a cacti or something that doesn't want to be um, well watered. Well, you could just water it, it has an airy mixture, kind of water pulls away from the terracotta planter pot um, really quickly. You probably just have to water it more frequently because this is a, a porous planter pot versus if you had something like this, which is a ceramic planter pot 
that is glazed, so the water's not gonna be pulling away from those pores. But I might as well move on to the next one. Um, and this is so simple, but sometimes I forget it, and it's so helpful. Having some of these little mesh screens, you might be able to pick it up at a, a hobby shop or whatever, and this one's clipped and cut, but the reason for these are like a potting soil screen. So you see that you have a hole in the bottom, right? Well, sometimes the potting medium, especially if you're using a really small potting medium, will fall out of the hole in the bottom and then you'll just have this like little anthill of potting medium when you're potting up your soil. So this little mesh screen allows the water to be relieved from the planter pot, but uh, keeps the soil in, or at least most of the soil in. So again, really easy houseplant hack to think about. Another thing I should mention too is if you're wetting your planter pot, um, what about wetting the planting medium? It's a little easier to work with sometimes if you wanna have your potting medium. So oftentimes if you're using like maybe a coconut coir mix or something that's primarily peat based, or even if you're using perlite, which you know is that puffed volcanic stone um, that gets a little dusty, just watering, you're putting a little water in your potting medium really helps not only help form the potting medium, so if you wanted to create like a little divot in your planter pot with that potting medium, you could do that. So it would be more, it would more easily form around the planter pot. Or if you wanna keep the dust down, that's a good way to go. And again, it's just putting enough water in just so the, the potting medium is easy enough to work with and play with. You don't wanna have something like uh, too wet and the potting medium's like floating in the water. Um, that's not something that you'd wanna do. But again, really good. You don't have to water your plant as much afterwards because there'll be wetness within the potting medium. So that's another tip. I've used that um, on occasion. Sometimes when I'm doing demonstrations, I don't show it, but when I'm actually doing it um, in my own home, and I have a big bowl where I could put the potting medium and mix it, then I'll do that. All right, my next tip is, and you've seen this on my channel probably, is under the shelf lights. I think these are absolutely amazing because it gives us an opportunity to put our plants in places maybe we couldn't put them before. So for instance, if you have a slightly darker shelf or if you have a shelf that's lower down from your window, then you could actually put some plants down there with under the shelf lighting. And there's so many great under the shelf lighting options now. And they're not all grow lights. They're not all marketed as grow lights, but they might be just really easy to use LED lights. And I have a great example of that in my Brooklyn house where I have a little under the shelf LED light that you could just touch with your fingers and it turns on and off and it's um, right above my stove. So it doesn't get a lot of light there at all because there's no window actually hitting it. And even the lights that I have in my current, in my house, they don't you know, give any light down there. So if it wasn't for that shelf, I probably wouldn't have, um, I probably wouldn't be able to have plants there. So uh, that's just a really good opportunity for somebody who may have a basement apartment or might not have a lot of light. Again, there's a lot of great lights that are out there, both grow light and non-grow light that are acceptable for a lot of plants. Related to that is timers. So timers are amazing because you don't even have to remember to turn on the lights. If you have your lights on timers, then the lights will automatically turn on at a specific time. And oftentimes a lot of these subtropical and tropical plants, you know, want to have anywhere from you know, six to 14 hours of light, right? Six is a little on the lower end. So if you have something that's between 10 and say 14 hours of light, then these plants will probably reward you with more growth. But you don't, if you're away from your house or you have a lot of lights, then, you know, the plant timers are a perfect solution for that. Um, so I often have my plants, uh, plant timers on at like seven in the morning and then they go off at seven at night. And, and that way it gives you a little bit of uh, relief as well. Like, cause sometimes these grow lights, even the ones that are balanced that look like, you know, normal daylight 
can be a bit much in the house. They could even get a little hot, even LED lights, they could get a little hot. So you might wanna not have them on all the time, or you might wanna have them on during the time of the day when you're away. And when you get home, then you could actually have the, the plant lights you know, turn off. So there's all sorts of different ways that you could program it to fit with your lifestyle and also to have the, the plant's lifestyle's needs met as well. Okay, this next one I really like and I have been using it for years now. And I don't know if this is a great example because this is kind of a fancy, <laughs> this is kind of a fancy tea thing. So I wouldn't normally put a plant in here because this is a ceramic tea strainer. See, that is a ceramic tea strainer. But why am, show why am I showing you this? Well, I really love to use these as plant root starters. So in a hydroponic setting. So this is a perfect example. This could be your, the water down below that you're using and you could put sphagnum or you could put um, LECA or whatever your, you know, vermiculite, whatever your choice is to actually root plants and have the water sitting down here. So it's a little hydroponic setup and you have your plant up here and it keeps everything all in one place. Um, this you obviously don't need. This is the, the, the lid top to the, to the teacup. So when you're doing an infusion, you don't let all of that um, good volatile uh, constituents leave the, the tea. So that, this is something, again, a little too fancy than what I would use. But typically with tea strainers, I'd use something that looks a little bit more like this. So alternatively, if I didn't want to just do total water propagation of this Hoya, for example, I would again put like LECA or um, vermiculite or a combination of soil and vermiculite, soil and perlite or a sphagnum. And I would just put, pop this in here, put this into a cup that fits and then put the water down in there. I absolutely love propagating that way. And um, it's been very, very effective. The roots look so good and it's just the right amount um, to, you know, infuse your tea, but also to uh, infuse the plant with roots. <laughs> so that's a good one and, a, and one that I definitely have used um, over the years of keeping house plants. Okay, one I showed you um, recently in an episode, and that is using a more eco-friendly soap to break up soil clods. So this is what I used, it was Dr. Browner's. This is peppermint, I thought I was using the one that doesn't have any scent, but I think the one that doesn't have any scent has a lighter blue color. And I might have that in Brooklyn, I thought I actually had it here, but I don't. But it doesn't matter, this is not like synthesized um, smells, these are uh, totally fine, but I would use the, the pure Castile soap without any scent typically. And this is a great solution for when you have something that is maybe more peat-based soil mix or something that you would get from nursery that has been sitting in that kind of primarily peat-based mix and it, it's, it feels like styrofoam or concrete. And that's what happened recently with one of my, my Hoya Abovadas. It got really, the, the soil got really compacted and um, it's really hard to break up. So what you would do is actually use this kind of like the saponins within a, a soap and just kind of work that soil. And oftentimes the water will start to actually go down into the soil, which is what you need because oftentimes when you have um, those soil clods, the water and the, just runs off or the fertilizer will just run off the edges and those roots will start to die back because the roots are not getting water. So that's another easy houseplant hack that you could do with just um, regular soap. And I would, again, suggest maybe of just a pure Castile soap, nothing that is too highly perfumey or that has synthetic um, uh, flavorings or smells or aromas in. Okay, my next one is using a heating pad to help with roots. Now I don't have a heating pad here, but there's a lot of great ones that are on the market and I will list them below in the description. But oftentimes if you're starting seeds in your house and or if you have uh, plants that you're starting roots, they like to have a little bit more heat down below. So that encourages the plants to root up and to actually emerge from their seed. So having some of those heating mats are really helpful. I also find it's really helpful that if you have like little little animals, like I had my little uh, my my little tutu, my tutu, my little diamond dove, or if you have um, you know certain animals that might be in your terrariums, maybe you have oh, I don't know, um, some kind of reptiles or anything. It's always nice to have heating mats. So you might already have heating mats around for your animals, or if they're feeling a little ill, you kind of put them on a heating mat and kind of warm them up a bit. 
Um, but you could also have heating mats for your plants too. So it's a dual purpose. Just having one of them around that you kind of plug in and it doesn't get too hot. It just gets, you know, maybe 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It just goes a little bit over room temperature. So it keeps it warm, um, especially if you have like plants that are sitting on your windowsill and it's a drafty, uh, then, you know, having that like, heating mat underneath is like very helpful. And you'll often see this in uh, greenhouses. Like you'll, they'll use mist benches and they'll have like heated benches and everything along those lines in order to be able to um, protect those plants and to actually encourage them to, to root up. So those are things that you could actually easily do in your home as well. Okay, the next idea that I have um, that I have definitely used is, you know, when you're trying to get terrariums or big glass jars, they could get really expensive. But if you go to a flea market or if you go to a secondhand shop, glass vases and glass bowls are really widely available and those turn into really great terrariums. So I had a friend who gave me um, a, a set of roses for my birthday and they came in this really big glass vase. I actually use that now as the terrarium for my Aglonema pictum tricolor. And it's big enough and, and easily could be turned, I think it's a better use than just having like cut roses. I think it's better use to have a living plant in there and, uh, and turn it into a terrarium. And it's quite large. You know, if you're buying something that's a terrarium, oftentimes they are pretty expensive. Or if you're using an aquarium and you're turning it into a terrarium, but if you could find glass vases, again, like at flea markets or secondhand shops, then they could actually be more affordable and very useful as terrariums for plants in the home that need a little of that higher humidity. Okay, so these next two houseplant hacks are things um, that I would say are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so back in 2018, uh, when I started this channel, I introduced folks to IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. Now, this is something that you would typically see in botanic gardens, or you might use Integrated Pest Management outside in your own gardens, but basically it's using beneficial insects. So beneficial insects are defined by insects that are more helpful to keeping the health of your plant versus something that will hinder or damage your plant. Nature uses beneficial insects in order to protect their plants. And, uh, and I started using integrated pest management in my own home and experimenting with that. And I know a number of you have adopted that in your own homes, especially if you have um, a, a veritable size of plants in your home. Now, I don't have that many plants yet <laughs> in the flock house here. So uh, I wouldn't use integrated pest management here. It just would not be cost effective. And that is one thing that I w will say for somebody who is new and starting out to um, plants, integrated pest manage management is probably not for you, but it really could help if you have a, a large collection, it could really help uh, bring the pest pressures down because if you say you've never had pests on your plant, well, it's probably all within due time that you'll probably get pests if you have, especially if you have a lot of them. Um, and you know, one bad sunburn on a plant, all of a sudden you have a bunch of spider mites and you're like, how did they get there? So, you know, it's something to consider, but I did an episode saying whether integrated pest management is right for you. And I, I really want people to understand that it is expensive and there's a host of other things that may be why it's not right for you. So if you want to click on that video and watch that, you could feel free to, to, to watch that as well. But I really, I really enjoy it. Um, in my own home, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, not all of the pests that I, uh, the beneficial insects that I've brought in are as useful as others. Uh, I, I love green lacewing larvae and, and I usually, usually use integrated pest management in a proactive uh, way. And you probably saw through a lot of my botanical tours on Plant One On Me that I often ask about what they use for pest pressures because it's something a lot of us actually go through and you'll, you'll have noticed that there is a recurring theme throughout the botanic garden tours that I do and almost all of them exclusively use integrated pest management but they use it in all sorts of different kinds of ways. So I thought that's really interesting and then hopefully it's something that folks can actually pick up on and potentially use um, if they kind of work past the fact that it is a little expensive um, and people do get a little squeamish about insects in the home, 
but oftentimes they really stick to the plant where their food source is. Um, now this is not a be all end all solution. It's not going to get rid of your non-beneficial insects, but it's going to help keep them at bay. So again, I would encourage you to watch that video that I did or watch any of the series of my integrated pest management videos that I've done so that you could actually learn from them and maybe um, not go into a very expensive blunder, expensive mistake. So related to that, and I've put this in a separate category, is fungus gnats. And I have a whole video, a couple videos actually, on fungus gnats, and I introduced um, some integrated pest management solutions, but kind of like a tiered solution to your fungus gnats back in 2018, and I kind of redid that in a later video. And you know, I didn't realize how bad fungus gnats are for most people when I asked on Instagram at one point, you know, what is your number one pest that you have in your home? And the vast majority of people said fungus gnats, which was crazy to me because I had only had one bad fungus gnat outbreak, and that's when I was starting to grow food in my house. And uh, those microgreens, you know, you keep them fairly moist, and I had a lot of fungus gnats within that. However, um, fungus gnats, I feel like, are, are fairly easy to, to deal with. And I use, again, some kind of integrated pest management solution is uh, mosquito bits. Now, mosquito bits is Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies israelensis. And you could find them in, at least in the United States. You might not be able to find them in other countries. So if anybody who's actually watching this, they might be either banned in your country or um, they might not just be available or nobody's uh, formulated it for your country or whatever. There might be some other solutions. I think Australia had a, had a, a problem with that the last time I had mentioned it. But these only affect fly larvae. So of course, if you have native fly larvae, I, I, I kind of never use mosquito bits um, outside unless maybe it's like in a bird bath or something because there's um, a lot of our native flies. I don't want to actually hurt a lot of our native flies. So if you have aquarium setups and you have fungus gnats or vivariums or if you have um, plants that require a lot of water, oftentimes you will attract a lot of fungus gnats. People often think that they're like vinegar gnats or something like that, like vinegar flies and they kind of fly up your nose and they're just quite annoying. Um, and they eat the fungus that is growing in the planter pot. So a lot of folks have actually moved to LECA so that they don't have that soil substrate where the fungus gnats are kind of flying around where the, the fungus would grow. Um, but if you use like the mosquito bits and use a combination of those yellow sticky traps, which will catch the adults, it won't catch the larvae, but it'll catch the adults. And um, you're using a combination of other things that you could use around your house. And I, again, have a full video on fungus gnats, then those are really helpful. But I thought I would pull that out and make it its own um, number of the things I like to use because fungus gnats is such a problem. Okay, so I think that's 13 uh, that I've done. Um, so the last two are ones that I have not used yet, but I love the idea of using them. And I probably will use them here on the flock property because I have a little bit more space. But these are two tips that I picked up while I was at the Gothenburg Botanic Gardens, and I absolutely love them. The first one was when I was walking around with uh, the orchid gardener, the, the woman who had taken over the orchid, the care of the orchid garden at Gothenburg Berg Botanic Gardens. And she said that with her orchids, which are in many cases like you know epiphytes, right? And they're growing on pieces of wood. Instead of using wire, which I usually had seen in botanic gardens, instead of using wire to wrap their roots around on the substrate or on the wood, they were using pantyhose, which I thought was so brilliant. So pantyhose, you know, that stretchy pantyhose that you could probably get in the, the egg, like the leg, the legs eggs. They use just like regular brown pantyhose, and which is nylon, of course, and some of it's stretchy. And they use that to affix the orchids onto the, the wood, which I think is just so brilliant. One, um, the, you know, the reason why they use, they use that is because the wires could cut into the roots and cause damage to the roots. So they're just using the pantyhose. And the two, what I like about it is that you really can't see the pantyhose. They kind of like just fade into the wood. So 
I really like that idea. And if I'm doing more epiphytic stuff that's like hanging on the walls or if I have a greenhouse and I hang that out there, then that's probably something I'll definitely use. And it's actually quite affordable as well. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that I wanted to pass on because it's like one of those things where you watch the whole entirety of a tour video and that's something, that's like a tip that you could easily miss. So I wanted to make sure to, to pull that one out because I love it so much. And, and the ones that I really love so much, they like really stick in my head and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's such a great idea. How come we'd never thought of that? And so I wanted to share that one with you. Okay, the last one is something um, I had seen before but never really internalized until I was at Gothenburg Botanic Gardens. And we went back into their Alpine collection and some of those plants are really temperamental when it comes to watering. And a lot of those plants uh, grow like a cushion. So they have this kind of uh, shape, like, you know, you see cushion mosses or whatever. And it's like, well, where do you water that plant? Because the cushion fills the whole planter pot, right? Well, what they do is they sink the pot entirely in a bed of sand. And the reason why I haven't used this yet in my own home is because I'm just not set up for that, but I definitely have some temperamental plants that it's really hard to water. You have to water them from the, the bottom up. And a lot of folks will ask, well, what's better, bottom up or top down watering? Well, oftentimes it kind of depends on, on the plant and the plant structure, right? And the plant form. So, uh, you know, and this is something that you could easily actually set up in your home. You just get, you know, one of those uh, plastic containers, you know, that you would, you know, stick your, uh, your moving containers or your socks in or your clothes, like when you're actually moving. And then you could fill that with sand and then you just sink some of these um, terracotta pots, make sure they're terracotta because if they're glazed, again, they're not porous, so the, the water's not going to seep through. But what they do is they take a gentle water around the sand and then the water gently trickles in to uh, sucks, get sucked into the terracotta planter pot and then the roots within the terracotta planter pot and the substrate within the terracotta planter pot then sucks up that water and then the plant gets watered. So you're not damaging the plant with any overhead watering um, and you're allowing the plant to suck up the amount of water that it actually needs in a very gentle fashion. And I really loved seeing that in action at Gothenburg Botanic Gardens. Um, so there was two things that I picked up there. And of course they use integrated pest management like I said, most of the, of the uh, greenhouses and conservatories and botanic gardens that I've gone to actually use that as well. In some cases they may use some type of synthetic, but in most cases they're using integrated pest management. But I don't know, I think that was like 15. <laughs> Hopefully it was uh, you know 15 of my favorite houseplant hacks. But I encourage you, if you have a channel, actually share what some of your favorite houseplant hacks are um, or let us know in the description below if you have some favorite ones that you wanna share with the rest of the crew here who watch this. And again, thank you guys. Thank you guys for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you who have subscribed and you like these videos and you come back week over week um, or you watch regularly because I really enjoy it and I really enjoy getting to know you through the comments below and I appreciate your support. All right guys, I'll see you in the next video. If you're looking to up your plant game, then check out our suite of courses and offerings, including Houseplant Basics, Troubleshoot Your Houseplants, the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet, and the Houseplant Masterclass. The courses provide you a certificate of completion when you're finished and a wealth of information that you could use to impress both your plants and your friends. More information can be found over at homesteadbrooklyn.com. And if you're seeking more information about gardening outdoors and homesteading in the country, then check out our new channel over at Flock Finger Lakes. See you there.